So, uh, background, what's Roofline? Uh, first question is that uh, we are only, yeah, we're only 40 million. Uh, uh, before I start, do you want any break? Is it a lot of information? Uh, you tell me. So I continue. I think it would be helpful if we could get a, everybody who is familiar with a roof line raise their hands. Uh, let's use the raise hand rather than the thumb. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a fair number that are not familiar with roof lines. So we'll go in. Uh, okay. We'll go into more detail with that. Okay. okay. Is there a natural breaking point right after roof line? Yeah, it could be. I mean, yeah. Okay. okay. So these slides are made from a, a colleague and we integrated here because we found them quite uh, nice. So um, attainable flops per second, here as you see on the way axis, the flops per second, is measured empirically on the given device. Do you remember that I told you about the macro bands on only perf? It runs and measures empirically based on some macro benchmarks. I think it's the next slides. Uh, uh, to measure the, I mean, the ACP 8 times X plus Y and other, and other stuff. So, FLOP is floating point operation. FLOP comes from common operations. Addition is one FLOP, multiplication one FLOP, uh, other operations two FLOP. Uh, FLOPs per second is number floating operation performed per second. So, this is quite basic. So, sorry for that. Uh, um, this is a nice example. And uh, here you see the arithmetic intensity flows per byte, okay? So uh, our colleague said, let's say you have this example, okay? This formula, um, flops equal one, have one operation, and bytes uh, have one read, uh, uh, one write, um, and say 44 bytes equal eight. So the flops per byte here is one eighth, okay? For this one, this is, this is like, how it's calculated the flops per byte uh, for your kernels, okay? Um, and also, yes, this one is a log-log plot to, to be more easy. Uh, it makes it to do the extrapolated performance along more laws, etc. So you see here, uh, the scaling is not like, you know, like the normal ones, it's log-log. Uh, so to be easier because otherwise it will be difficult to, to read it, I would say. And here we are, um, here's the peak flops per second of your compute, and here's the memory, okay? And there's a point that they are connected, okay? Uh, and these are empirically measured values, uh, different SKUs will have unique plots, meaning I use GPU 0, GPU 5, can be different, but don't expect something extreme, right? If it's extreme, that's a problem for me. Uh, but uh, also don't expect to be same numbers exactly. Um, um, okay, I will have used a suite of simple kernels to empirically derive these values. These are not theoretical uh, values, okay, and indicated peak performance under unicorn conditions. And you know what we mean unicorn here is like marketing stuff. So here you will see the actual achievable performance. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. And of course, um, here, um, at the number of flops per second uh, is the minimum of the peak flops or the, uh, so the minimum, or, or it's here, for example, or somewhere here, I, I mean, if it's computer memory bound, or here in this place is uh, arithmetic intensity time peak of a gigabyte per second. And, and the balance is where, uh, uh, okay, well, arithmetic intensity is the peak flops uh, divided by peak gigabyte per second. So a typical machine balance is five to 10 flops per byte, uh, 40 to 80 flops per double to exploit compute capability. On m to 50X, it's 16 flops per byte. Uh, to have a 120 flops per double to exploit compute capability. Uh, let's be honest, uh, <laughs> uh, you cannot change uh, always your algorithm to be like that. And, and this is quite strict, I would say. Um, what I mean is like, 
yes, it's nice, but um, uh, it can be a huge effort to achieve these numbers, right? Uh, so one, and I think it's a, uh, let's not talk because it's next slide, I suppose. Um, so uh, five performance regions for uh, our Taylor compute, okay? Uh, this, so, so let me, um, I will explain later, but it cannot be above the peak flops, right? If it's above peak flops, something is wrong, but we'll see something later. Uh, bandwidth, it cannot be above HBM. Uh, why, I'm, I'm, why I'm skeptical? It cannot be above HBM, but we have also Dell 2 L1 LDS, right? So it can be because of the other things, but you understand the main concept, I mean, it cannot be above HBM, but if it's L1, L2, LDS, it can be. Uh, compute bound. So we say kernel compute bound when it's quite close here. Okay, something like that here. And we say bound is bound here. Okay, so we are happy when the kernels are close here. Okay, for it's for memory, even inside, and for compute, even above if you use uh, 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 some uh, uh, metric operations, etc. Now, poor performance is a rest. I mean, okay, I cannot say that if, if what is my point that I cannot say this is poor performance, right? I mean, it's it's close, it's close, but okay. Uh, but yes, if something is quite low, this is poor performance and needs to be improved. Um, so the final res result is a single roof line plot presenting the peak telemetry performance uh, in terms of flows per second on a given device and arithmetic intensity. Okay, uh, and we have an application independent way to, of measuring and comparing performance on any platform. And this is what the next one says. So imagine you run kernels. This is kernel A, B, C, D, A, T, L, H, and you know the flops per second. What's good performance? How we say that, oh, this is good, this is excellent. That's the highest flops per second. Um, we sort kernels by the arithmetic intensity. Down on the X axis is arithmetic intensity, it's the flops per byte. Okay, so now you see per arithmetic intensity. Now, compare performance relative to hardware capabilities. Okay, so now we we'll plot the lines, the peak flops, you see. And the kernels near the roof line are making good use of computational resources. Kernels can have low performance, but make use of bandwidth. Okay, this ones. But this ones, okay, this ones are Increase arithmetic intensity, uh, then uh, bandwidth is limited. So for this one, and kernels not near roofline should have optimization that can be made to get closer to roofline. So if I go back, uh, this flop per this flop per second, for example, is is above than this one, but this is memory bound, so the performance is considered okay, but this one is is poor, or this one. Is above this significant, but this is memory bound, but this is not, and it's quite, these two are quite poor, as you see. Uh, so, this is a way uh, to understand wh what is good compared to the hardware you have. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay, I would say here, make, okay, I will show you the next slide, but I will not talk. Because we are talking about this now, uh, let's make, I think, a, a small break for people to not overload them. Can you go back to that roof line plot? And uh, for those, yeah, that one's good enough. I, I um, see so. Okay. If, if people want to ask questions here. Okay. I think Ash, Ash, you have a question? Hi, George. Sorry. Um, yes, I was wondering. Uh, you you have the we have the bandwidth bounds and the compute bound area. What sort of uh, margin are we looking for for computation to reach within that? Is it twenty percent within the peak uh, values or twenty percent? 
Uh, I don't have really the numbers, but I would say, I would say 10% probably. Okay, That's so about 10% of the peak. So we, we measure the peak values for the bandwidth and, and uh, flops uh, for the GPU. And then, you know, as long as we're within 10% of that in the computation, that's fine. Okay. So it, yeah. I think it depends a lot on the kernel too. Your oh. current, you need to know your kernel. If it's complex, you you may not be able to get quite as close. Yeah. 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 It's, okay. I mean, it's a matter of um, understanding what the, what the achievable is um, to set that that boundary and a few things as Bob mentioned, um, the kernel uh, performance, the hardware itself, which will come up in the next section, but um, it's it's good enough for the moment for discussion. So I do want to point out that we're looking at this compute bound and it looks like a fairly narrow region, but this is a log log plot. Yeah. So you may still be able to get a little bit of, you know, that can be quite a bit difference uh, if you're at the lower end of that uh, sort of uh, imaginary region. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The I think the main thing is it's it's a good place to kind of figure out where you should spend most of your effort. So obviously anything that is dominating the overall wall time you try to fix, but but here also there could be things that you cannot fix anyway. Give it the hardware, even if it's spent, if you have lots of time, like most of the compute is in, let's say, one of the lower kernels, right? The floating point operations, but it's bandwidth bound. The idea is normally, at least if, in that case, if you've got your kernel set up right and you move to a different GPU with higher bandwidth, you get an immediate performance gain because you're bandwidth bound. It's probably going to pop up a little bit. It's not guaranteed to, but at least it probably will move up if you, if you are bandwidth bound. Yeah. Same thing with compute bound. You might be there, but it also probably won't necessarily migrate up that much. So the biggest value of the roof line is a visual. It gives you a quick visual understanding. And at DOE, we would get audited periodically on how well our applications were doing uh, compared to the peak flop. Uh, value for that system and as memory grew slower and flops grew faster um we would be at one percent two percent of peak flops and so they'd say well you're not using all the machine we don't want to buy you a new one <laughs> this, this visual uh, representation shows you that that's not achievable for some kernels some kernels it might be so that's the the visual value of of this. Um, it gives you a much better understanding of what your limits are. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have a question regarding uh, does the uh, OmniPuff uh, gives the uh, uh, roofline uh, plot for all the co uh, all the kernels in the core, or it does report uh, uh, cumulative fashion? Top ten, top ten uh, time-consuming kernels. Ah, okay. So for each yes. of them, it will plot uh, like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So by default, you will see ten kernels in the same roof line. Ah, okay. But I will show you also how to do it per kernel also. Okay. Thank you. Edric, did you have a question? I uh, yes. Um, don't expect you to be able to give a general answer, but um, looking at that plot there, um, to me, so I'm new to this, but it looks like we've got you know a great performance, you know, right up until that um, is it second or third last point where it falls out of the that um 10% was it um band? Um, yeah, just are there a, what would be what are a couple sort of common clauses? For that, like, um, or are there, like, you know, because it seems like, well, actually, I'm not sure. Yeah, where would I start to look if I'm seeing that sudden kind of drop off? Um, yeah, this is the one million dollar question, basically. Uh, you should see that your kernel to to understand, to to understand the um, what should be the, the not the bottleneck, but I mean. Uh, for example, we'll see later the read and write operations. If you read and write a lot of memory, 
but the kernel should not because you have a really simple kernel, etc. Maybe you don't use efficient the, the registers, um, uh, or um, how to say, or you, or you don't use a lot of the compute units, right? Maybe so you, if you do a uh, 50% allocation of the compute units, which you can see from Omniperf, you need to increase your uh, problem size, or you or you have a rich spilling and you have to decrease your workload size. So there are many ifs. There is not one answer here. That's why it makes it complicated, and that's why the tool will be better with some guided analysis uh, that I hope to have in the future to, to, to guide you to say, this would be the problem. There's other stuff as well, Adric, so it's not obvious. Like you could have stuff that has more flops, but there might be that you want to get rid of some flops. If you have a divide and it can be a multiply by the inverse value, you might as well do the inverse value once instead of doing divide that technically has more like operations implied or things that have approximations. If you have a Taylor series expansion, maybe you, you don't have to do everything. So there's there's other things as well. You could try to reduce the in, the intensity, arithmetic intensity. Uh, you're gonna do fewer flops, but at least also that that might actually give you some improvements because it might be able to get more, it might be a memory bound code that you're just kind of doing lots of flops for no particular reason for, <laughs> right? Uh, at, at some point, my the, the increase in um uh, memory, uh, sort of it's, it's, yeah, it's leading to, yeah, Which is, do you have really insufficient higher... cache management or something? It's just not able to cope with the um, that inefficiency beyond that point. So that's where reducing the flops kind of would bring it back within that form and region. Say, yeah, I mean, as I said, like if you have a memory bound code, but you are on it, like are doing artificially doing more flops than you need to do. They're silly these examples, but I'm thinking of stuff where you could probably get by with something that's a little smaller, or. Uh, the things where you, as I said, maybe you do the, the the example I think would be the inverse square root of something, right? There's the doom algorithm for the quick inverse square root. Mm -hmm. That's acceptable. Then that's acceptable. It does way fewer floating point operations than an actual inverse square root. Uh, yeah. it, it is also quicker, but it's also not as good an answer, uh, which is what the big thing for all oh, fast, right? The fast math stuff. Maybe it's mm -hmm. okay, but you should be careful. <laughs> Thanks. Also, for example, if you use the LDS memory, because it's too small, if 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 it's occupied all of it for some blocks, the other blocks will stall till they That's have perfect. free LDS. So there's so many ifs depending on on your on your kernel, I would say. And always you want to do operations. Uh, I mean, a matrix or something. Use libraries. Don't try to implement your stuff. If something exists in library, like Blast or whatever use the library, right? Because it will be optimized and because also we have some heuristics that it can do two things. I can do matrix operations that the peak flops will be above this one, okay? Because it goes much more higher performance and we have also the, the packed FP32 arithmetics which do two FP32 operations per cycle and that's double performance and more than double than just FP32. And this happens from the libraries, right? Because the libraries are implemented by experts that they know what they're doing and don't try to do something that exists in the library. Just use the library and you have better performance. So I also want to caution against relying on some of the tools with guided analysis. Uh, often I find the guided analysis doesn't necessarily give you the keys to improving the performance. Knowledge of the kernel in your algorithm are usually your your most valuable uh, piece of information, and un, you know, an understanding you know what you're doing uh, is going to you know the guided analysis is guessing. It doesn't know your kernel. Just looking at statistics. Starting point. Yeah. That's a question. I say Hans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just a follow-up question regarding the you said you the the Rufman model plot out top ten kernels. So these top ten kernels will be picked on basis of performance, or it will be like worst performing kernels hitting the code. It will try to uh, plot. Time consuming. Time consuming. Oh, okay. Yes. It doesn't. It doesn't know if the performance is good or bad. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's time consuming. I would. Say. Yeah. 
be based on the sampling but, uh, thing. Uh, it's not sampling, it's, it's segmentation. But if you optimize one kernel and you rerun, maybe this is out from the top 10. So another goes to the top 10, right? So it's the top 10 of the time consumed. Okay. Um, Toby, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, well? yeah. I just had a, yeah, I just had a question about how um, the arithmetic intensity and attainable flops is actually being collected by OmniPerf. Because um, you can imagine during a kernel execution, there's lots of other instructions being executed besides floating point ones. So is it is it actually collecting instructions per byte, or is it actually collecting flops, just the floating point instructions only per byte transferred? This one, <laughs> this is like the the formula to take all the flops different based on the different instructions that happen. FP sixty four uh, and uh, thirty two sixteen uh, MFMA operations, etc. And the arithmetic intensity calculated also from formulas here and to find the peak one for the LDS. I haven't talked about this yet. L two HBM, etc. So all of this happened automatic for us, thanks to OmniPerf. RockProf used this, all of this, and it calculated for us. Um, um, okay, so, so it seems like it's a conglomerate um, instructions per byte. Is that is that correct? To get the arithmetic intensity? Yeah, for the arithmetic intensity, yes. It's, it's like that. So, uh, so we, based on other counters, basically, to calculate it, uh, all the arithmetic intensity in the flops. And uh, sometimes that's why there's this sign here. We can find some bugs and fix it, but uh, lately we feel that this is not bad. It's okay, the, the formulas. Okay, yeah. So you're not just measuring just floating point instructions, you're also measuring other no. instructions as well. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a lot of them, I would say. And okay. that's why yep. uh, you cannot overhead by doing this stuff. And also, here I would say um, the way to get the have one flop for the transcendent and the, this one is the instructions, several instructions uh, that could, I think here it's one flop, yes. And, and, and the MFM operations count flop directly it's in unit of 512 operations. And, and the, yeah, the profiling request, okay, this is for application replace, okay, but and here explains, not explains exactly, but uh, you can find them in, uh, you have XML files, right, from the prof that you can say what is each one of these. But we try to capture everything, right? Because we don't know in advance what is the kernel about. Yeah, so, so if I had an, an algorithm and I did a theoretical um, arithmetic intensity, uh, that would actually be different to what OmniPerf would collect for that. It's yeah. algorithm. Yeah, I mean, and if it's not uh, correct, uh, yeah, it should be a problem. But just to double, can I, can I just jump in, George? It's just, just to make sure, yeah. because as far as I remember, it's the thing we've been It doesn't, it's not like an instruction intensity, because a full instruction intensity is different, right? If you did binary shift operations, if statements, those those do not necessarily qualify because you can do a comparison, get a one, but then you can decide in this statement. So those instructions, logic operators, are they actually included in your roofline model as well? Because no, I don't they're think not. They were included. Exactly. Okay. So that's no, they're just not. to clarify. Yeah. Toby. You can also be you can also be limited by instruction cache if you're jumping around. But it tends yeah. to sort of follow the the uh, bandwidth limit. So uh and you can see you could argue with you know the specifics on here like transcendentals I, I don't think is really one flop but what would you give it then so yeah it's a measure yes uh, I, I don't know if that helps clarify a, a bit more toby as well uh yeah yeah it, it does clarify it a little bit yeah yeah so let's try to simplify this a little bit so if we look at the flops we have no 16 we have no third. We, we have no single precision or half precision. Half of those drop out. We basically are counting FMAs and uh, 
multiply adds. We don't weigh divisions any more uh, than a multiply, even though they usually take a three to five cycles instead of one. Yeah. So it's a fairly simple. You could do this by hand for for most simple kernels. The bandwidth is different. It's complicated because you've got that very complex memory hierarchy. So it removes the, the bank conflict, okay, from LDS, for example. <laughs> I don't know how they came up with some of this. Sorry? I don't know how they came up with some of this. Uh, yeah, we, we have people with uh, the hardware people. And, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, Alex, you got I wanted to, to come here after the break, but who are here already. Um, so, Ash asks, will this calculation be different for MI250, which will be available on Satonic? No. Uh, the arithmetic uh, won't change, uh, really. It's MI200 series. Yeah. Okay, we're well, good. Okay. So, we're going to continue now with the uh, roof line calculations on MD6 MI200. Um, in order to just to remember better the architecture, here is a one simple uh, GCD. So MI250X has two of them. This is just one, okay? So here you can see the compute units. I think it has 110 compute units. And you have here the LDS memory that's local to the compute units. You have the four SIMTs. Okay, that are occupied the way front of uh, 64 uh, threads and uh, they can have a maximum 40 wave fronts. Uh, the scalar unit um, registers uh, scalar and vector. Vector 1 data cache, which is this is the first layer of cache for, uh, uh, yes, for cache. There's also the, the data set memory, but also this is the cache. And if it doesn't hit here, it goes out to L2, okay? And then there's also data fabric that goes uh, peer GCD to, okay, to the, to the next GCD. They interconnect, they're connected to the same MA250X, which here is 200 uh, gigabit per second per direction. And there's the remote socket also, another CPU or GPU, and memory controller, and then it goes to the HBM memory, depending which TCD you're using, etc. Okay, so this is about more to remember the structure when you see the results, uh, what's LDS, uh, what's register, and which layer is the L1 data cache, etc. So as you understand, the best would be not to get out from the compute unit uh, because you need more cycles to access the the, the rest uh, memory and it's also slower. And here's an example from uh, this is from uh, Grafana uh, roofline. And you can see here, here you can see uh, plenty of kernels. And uh, let me try to zoom to the here you can see, for example, uh, uh, yeah, here's the current. <laughs> That was funny because I had an issue that uh, sometimes I was thinking, what's the CUR kernel? It means current for the Grafana and the baseline. And you can see the HBM, the L2, L1, and have different signs, okay? The asterisk, okay, etc. And you have the, the memory, the different lines. So this is MFMA operations can achieve above the, uh, the, the, the peak uh, per second with the normal operations. And if you zoom, uh, you can see that some overlap, right? You see more than one color, for example. For example, this is a really close to compute bound. Um, this one, of course, is not really great, I would say. This comes close to, to be memory bound, but still is not. And this, this one, to be here, you are already are, you are using the LDS, okay? So if you if you are not using LDS, you will never be so uh, high in the memory bound, I would say. 
Uh, so this is more an example to see how it looks and why you have so many lines based on the memory level. And uh, so if, if you use library that does some MFM operations, you will see here you can, etc. I mean, between uh, somewhere here. Uh, so we said about empirical roofline benchmarking, right? Uh, so uh, measure achievable peak flops, uh, 30 to 64 is the same. Now this is doesn't look good, but we can do it the hands-on. Uh, here, what you see here, uh, here some of the last uh, roof line, this is a banner, it's nothing more. And it starts, uh, sorry, this is scripted by, by the way, and starts on device zero to run the micro benchmarks, see profiling, HBM bandwidth, L2 bandwidth, and says how many work groups, work group, group size, total bytes, duration, uh, mean value, standard deviation, and you see start seeing the, the actual numbers. These are run every time you run roof line, it, it, they are also executed to calculate it on the current GPU, what's the achievable peak performance uh, for computation and, and, uh, and uh, memory. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, LDS vector L1 data cache from the previous, if you go previously, you see now what means the words, right? LDS vector L1 L2 cache HBM. Now, internally, I, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, how to say, I, I was not involved in this effort. Um, they use macro benchmark algorithms. So, VLU flop, they use A, A times X plus Y, MFMA operations, matrix multiplication based on FMA intrinsic, uh, point chasing for memory, streaming copy for HPM bandwidth. So, you can start to use some various uh, benchmarks uh, to try to uh, measure the actual performance. Now, uh, we'll see a bit about this. Uh, yeah, they had to define some, uh, how many flops take some operations, right? Addition, multiplication, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the different value of math instructions assuming 64 active threads for VLAU. Uh, MFMA is unit of 512. I have seven uh, uh, in total uh, transcendental instructions that take uh, uh, one flop and require, sorry, this is four application replays. Uh, three with counters, one without counters to have to extract the, the timing, the proper timing. And we use hardware counters that uh, I don't even know by, uh, by heart all of them. And I can recognize some back conflict LDS and all of the stuff, but it's a plenty. And this is how they created the formula, right? Uh, 64 uh, for the Wavefront stuff and for 512 from a VLAU. Uh, so for, from the FMA, and they start measuring that various um, LDS bandwidth, uh, vector L1 data cars, etc., and calculate the arithmetic intensity uh, basically on uh, dividing total flops uh, with the, uh, the bandwidth of the uh, memory requirements. And this is the way that they calculated uh, the empirical hierarchical roof line. Now, uh, I don't think this has changed. I mean, it's the same sometimes, maybe something has changed, something small. Uh, sometimes we found bugs and we fix them, or people can tell us and uh, investigate it if something uh, should be changed. Uh, <clears throat> now, for those who like yeah, to take their hands dirty, all of this, okay, measured, is nothing more than using the rock prof with, a, let's say, a TXT file, with the counters, how to measure the HPM bandwidth, right? You need these counters. So one, two, three, four, five PMC means that the roof, the, the rock prof will run five times. So if you do rock prof does I this TXT times up all in your application, you will take the measurements of these counters. Okay. And of course you have to load the CSV file to in the in the viewer. And, and make the final metric values using the equation. So you take these metrics and then you have to make it in Excel or something to make the, the formulas, the corresponding one, okay? Um, and there requires one application to play for its PMC line, okay? So <clears throat> this is a, a nice way if you want to do it yourself. And also, I mean, uh, also I had found 
and found some some let's say bugs uh, by using this approach and when I was I was like um, judging some results from Omniperf and, and we were able to fix some stuff reporting and fixing so that's really uh, nice how it works uh, so something else. George yes Pascal's got a hand up oh sorry yes yeah, no, so it's just a question about the matrix cores. So, because you in the previous one was the micro benchmarks, right? There's nothing that would get normally the throughput of a, the matrix cores. So, because uh, you've got floats, HMB values. I, I mean, the roofline model, let's say the peak performance of things that would be well suited to matrix cores versus something that's just sort of the general. Be threads, they, they slightly different uh, maximum floating point operations, right? They have a different theoretical maximum. So, is there something in in missing in Omni Trace, or my is this a silly question? Because you would get different performance if you had something that's sort of optimized to use the matrix cores versus something that's just going to any any of the compute threads. So I don't understand the question. For the matrix operations, so it's not for matrix, what, like so for the because obviously, so NVIDIA had tensor cores, right? And so the actual, let's say, peak performance for the tensor cores is slightly different from the peak performance of just, let's say, a yeah. kernel that that is just doing vectors, right? Uh, yes. It's normally, why they really put a lot of tensor cores, they make sure they've got uh, high bandwidth as well. They they're quite let's say fat. So now the Mi two fifty Xs have matrix cores. Right, and so if I have a kernel that is basically designed to use matrix, the matrix cores versus a very similar kernel, but I I just tried to the out results are kind of the same, but I'm not structuring for matrix cores. I would expect a different performance and different memory bound possibly, because the way I have to structure sort of instructions and the size of what I'm doing might be different. So I'm, I'm and here you measure you say internally develop micro benchmark algorithms to get that that empirical hierarchical roofline performance model. But there's nothing here mm -hmm. saying specifically that it's testing the matrix cores themselves. So I'm asking, is there anything in Omnipert that would that would be properly constructing a roofline model for something that's kind of designed to just use matrix cores? It's showing <laughs> here that it's doing a doing a test with the matrix cores. I'm not sure on the plot. Uh, does the plot show different lines for? So, so, yeah. Uh, so the so that's a the matrix, one. Yeah. Yeah, so we got two lines. Okay, the matrix matrix fuse multiply add, matrix fuse fold. Yes. Add. Okay. I wasn't too sure if the matrix operation was a matrix core operation or just like a matrix. As in no, a it's a matrix, matrix. matrix core. So matrix matrix core. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, handles also the FP16, FP32 for machine learning uh, workloads. So, uh, it, it produced war of line for FP64, 32, it's the same, and for FP16 and something else that uh, is more for machine learning, uh, usually. So uh, then um, a, a follow up question uh, would, would, would OmniPerf then you would have to request saying, I'm doing a, a, a mixed precision operation and I want to know the performance given that mixed precision? Is it something? It, it does it automatically. It Doesn't will make you two roof lines. Two okay. roof lines will make. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, wait a bit. Less. Okay. Ah, yeah, it goes here. Okay, yeah. Um, now, as I was saying, there is profiling overhead. So, always, as I said, uh, be careful what you're doing. So, Omniperf does this for you and much more advanced. So this is just if you want to get your hands dirty or you don't trust some numbers and maybe there's something back then you want to identify to report something, etc. Um, so now subsystem performance analysis uh, about memory subsystems and uh, this is from um, Grafana uh, and you can see here the two utilization, the cache heat with colors, etc. This one I will not say a lot because uh, this is a trick that depends on Omniperf and another um, not rock prof is another tool that's really internal. Um, it is about the cache hit rate per channel. Uh, I think for uh, yeah for L2. Um, you have to get the right bandwidth, the right bandwidth. Okay, uh, uh, some requests per second. Here you see the, the metric. Okay, 
and uh, there is another this is l2 fabric transactions okay this is uh, in the fabric level of l2 and l2 fabrics interface styles sags per wave okay for read and, and write and okay that's bm styles here so for example i think it's it's a number i think but this is not a lot uh, I mean, if it's number two, at least I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure about it from there. Now, sender compute components, wavefront, live instruction mix, etc. So here, it's like, do I have brands or a uh, usual DS, uh, scalar memory, VLU vector, uh, uh, VMEM, and you can do statistics from wavefront runtime statistics, a kernel time, um, uh, and instructions per wavefront. Uh, web cycles dependencies or if you have a lot some wavefronts style uh, because of dependencies okay um wavefront occupancy and you can see here i have a, a mfma 60 uh, 64 uh, beat 38 percent so you can see really um this is speed of light compute pipeline okay so you can see literally your instructions how are distributed etc and you can see a lot of data basically that's why i'm saying it's overwhelming and uh, you need to check exactly what you want now i uh, guess i haven't discussed that uh, omnipef profile does n workload name roof only it will not do any analysis about memory it will do the minimal things only for uh, roof line and then you do omnipef analyze gui and you load the gui and you can see like that uh, this is arithmetic, it's not AI <laughs> arithmetic intelligence, it's arithmetic intensity for HBM, L2, L1. Okay, and you can see the peak compute here, as we said before. Okay, uh, for uh, matrix cores and then uh, VLU. And this is the for the HBM, uh, uh, continuous in the L2, L1, LDS. Okay, so this code is, is quite close to memory bound. I would say. And I added here, when a profile with the roof only, a PDF with the roof line will be created. So you can load the GUI, but you, for roof line, you can take a PDF. PDF would be like that, it would be like that. This is a thing for PDF also. Now, what you see here is one kernel. You can have many kernels, top 10, top ten right? In order to get the name of the kernels, you can add the flag kernel names, and a second PDF will be created where they will say, this mark is that the name of the kernel. So to see the names, you need the second PDF. Except if it's one kernel and you know which kernel is that, or you have only a few and you know by heart that this is a good one, the other is bad, and you know how to handle it. But sometimes it's, it's more complicated, especially when you see it for the first time, the roof line, right? You don't know exactly for sure. So this is a request that uh, uh, I had asked for another application and they added uh, the developers. Now, this is a screenshot, um, partial screenshot from the web page. Uh, so I, I start I start the standalone GUI and I have here a list of the kernels and I select the kernel. This is a Cocos uh, kernel. It's huge, I would say, uh, the path, etc. And this is um, the visualization of the roof line. So from the start, from the GUI, uh, you can see the roof line, okay, which now we know a bit what it is, and you can um, go through performance analysis from each subsystem. You will see the table for HBM, L1, and 12 ds and um, and you can see baseline roof line comparison. The roof line comparison uh, is is mainly I would say with uh, Grafana uh, because it doesn't do comparison uh, from the standalone GUI. And you can see kernel statistics, so you can see a lot of information uh, in general. Now, something, one metric that I like, another metric, one uh, IP block that I like is the SPI, SPI resource allocation, because this one is about the wavefront dispatching failure due to resource limitation. So you can see, uh, let me, okay, you can see here that. Uh, I failed to hear because insufficient uh, vector registers. Okay, 
So the, here I have to probably to decrease the work group size or something like that to, to uh, because here the web, web request failed on average and blah, blah, blah. Okay, I, I keep it on average and, uh, and, and have a an stall, okay, stall rate and the reason. Uh, we have cases that you cannot see many things. The truth is, it depends. It depends on your, your code, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, we have a situation we need to explore uh, <clears throat> because the OpenCC prints some zeros here. So, but this is specific uh, programming model, etc. So, I like this table because it can guide me a bit what is the wrong of some web flows to fail, for example, and that's. Uh, Quite important, I would say. Um, ah, yeah. So I had, this is the first time that I I present that because one moment that I wanted to show you a real case why I was not using Grafana. <clears throat> and I was helping a, a user with a Nico code. Uh, it does six point seven million dispatches of kernels. Uh, this is with one MPI process, right? Not scaling, that, that's all no, Omniperf. And I was creating eight to 10 gigabyte of data, profiling data from one MPI process. Uh, when I tried to, to load it to Grafana, uh, I crashed the server, uh, I crashed the Grafana, and I had to restart Grafana every time that I was doing that, so I stopped doing that. Uh, when I tried the standalone GUI, uh, good luck to load 10 gigabyte to a, to a browser, etc. It was, was not working. So, executing Omniperf without any option, which means memory analysis, etc., it took, it would take 36 hours, um, while singly non instrumented execution takes less than one hour. So, 17 times execution, but takes more than double. Why? The, the, the counters add overhead and sometimes significant overhead because it runs, uh, we'll see like three counters, eight counters, 20 counters, 30 counters, for example, and more counters adds more overhead, okay? <clears throat> and we had totally around nine gigabytes of profiling data from one API process. Uh, upload to Kafala server was crashing, started on GUI, no. So there is an option in Omniperf, that's came or you can define which specific kernel to profile. Now, you know the top 10 kernels, and you go, does k 0 to 9 for the top 10, or does k as the name of the kernel, okay? Then you, you do 10 times uh, this, this run, and you get to take the 10 kernels, different profiling data, different executions, can be the same GPU, can be another GPU, of course, you don't forget, it's not exactly the same GPUs, but we we'll consider them almost the same. So if you do it in parallel also, you, 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 have, you gain time, you don't take 36 hours, you take much less hours, right? And this creates profile data only for the selected kernel. And you can visualize each kernel. So in, in my case, I was doing, a, uh, I think, yeah, it's, yeah, that's a kernel roof line. Does K kernel name or kernel ID, roof only, binary arguments. And this was the only way that I could um, uh, visualize uh, a, a bit interactively. Why I'm saying a bit interactively? Because if I do the 36 hours, it will create a PDF, right? I mean, with roof only, it will create a PDF. And back then, we didn't have the kernel name, so I didn't know which kernel is, is what, okay? So how to, with the kernel names, it's, it's, it's a bit better. But in order to not wait 36 hours and etc., you can use the dash K, kernel name, and you do it per, per kernel name. So you do it more times, I agree, but I couldn't visualize otherwise the data. So that was, was good for me. So for big codes, so that's why I'm saying, this is not a, this is not a, 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 a hero run. This is a real case. And uh, basically, they, they were using the 80% of the Lumi. <clears throat> and this was what, what one API process was doing. Uh, so this will try to actually use the real input for one API process.
So uh, that's it with the slides. Um, and, ah, see questions, yes. Yeah, there's um, just a quick one. Uh, the kernel name is easy to be able to obtain like uh, from rock pro. It's the same. Like yes, I mean, yes, yes. Not vary between tools, etc. Yeah, with the proof, and I mean, kernel name is, is, is without the arguments, right? Just the kernel name, no arguments. Um, now, if you have, uh, uh, I guess I know that the, some C++ templates have some crazy stuff. Uh, it can be more complicated. So in that case, um, let me think. You can run a smaller problem to see the top 10 kernels from the Omniperf, and you know the numbers, 0 to 9. You can use this one because the kernel name can be complicated sometimes in some strange cases with the C++ and templates. I mean, you can have the same two different kernels with just different arguments, for example. Yeah, so so this means that um, Omniperf sort of runs rockprof first to... Yeah, many times. To, to collect the counters. And then run, runs again, it runs several times to produce all the analysis. Yes. Okay. Thank but, you. To, but to find the top 10 candidates, you can use, uh, yeah, I can use Rockprof, hopefully. And because, just to explain something, if Rockprof fails for your application, all the tools will fail for your application, right? Because at one level, we run Rockprof. Um, and in this case, um, Rockproof can be useful to identify with one run uh, the top kernels and then use it for uh, Omniperf. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Marco, you had a question? Uh, yes, I have a question on the, with, about the Coco support uh, in OmniTools. So, as you show, showed in the examples uh, um, on the slides, where the, the Cocos kernel names can be quite long because it's, uh, it uses a lot of templating programming. Uh, so, uh, what, what you can do with Cocos, there is a little Cocos plugin that allows you to, to print out the kernel names that are uh, given in the, in the Cocos program in, by the programmer, print them out as RockTX labels. And so was why and that that this can be very helpful for instance in, in perfetto because then you can use instead of using the actual kernel name you can use the, this rock tx tagging that allows you to to have way more readable uh naming for the uh, for the kernels uh so was wondering whether uh, the omni tools currently support uh the the information provided by rock tx uh by the rock tx trace to, to visualize the improved naming Omnitrace for sure, yeah. Omnitrace does the RockTX, but um, Omniperf, um, I don't want to say no, but I'm not sure about Omniperf. Because but Omniperf that could be very handy, as I said, in, yeah, in, uh, in knowing better what, what we're looking at. Uh, uh, yeah, as you see, it's, it's very lengthy. This is a question. This is yeah. manual, right? You, you you mean to add? Is it automatic or you add the RockTX man, uh, manually? So I mean, you, you can do it either. Uh, the the interesting thing is that the Cocos developers provide these Cocos tools, and one of them with just one flag allows to to automatically print out the the developer chosen kernel namings uh, as RockTX uh, labels. Okay. In the okay. In the profile uh, information, not... and then you, for instance, perfetto, and then if you do that, you, you just enable the in the rock prof. You use, I think, it's uh, the rock tx trace flag, mm -hmm. and then for instance, perfetto is then able to, to to leverage that information and provide improved naming for for the kernels in the in the timeline tracing. So if you need to activate the rock tx, I suppose Omniperf doesn't do it okay. yet. Look okay. at. Uh, I, I imagine that I think this one was the first time that they saw Cocos because uh, yeah. Cocos I mean with Omniperf because uh, they hadn't tested. Uh, I was in a hack and said, mm -hmm. "Let's test it, and it does work." Yeah, sure. uh, yeah, I know. The the name is really not good as it is now. The kernel name. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. It's 
can take it as an informal feature request then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Thank right. you. Okay. So, so I want to add a couple, uh, a couple additions to the slides here. Uh, the last hackathon we did, um, we had some codes failing in Omniperf, and the problem is that it did not have a deterministic path through the code. You can think Monte Carlo, or even when we set the random number generator uh, to a fixed value, it wouldn't go down the same quite the same path and it would have a key merge problem. So you can have certain cases where it fails and we are collecting uh, reports of those. Uh, but if you've got wildly divergent paths from one run to another, you can see how that may not be a, a good situation when you're doing multiple passes and trying to accumulate uh, values and merge them. Also, we observed that the, uh, I don't know exactly, but the um, Omniperf was failing and Omnitest was failing in the code, that, but the code had bugs and, um, and memory leaks. And uh, so something was interfering with the profiling. And when the bugs were fixed, then the tools were running. So sometimes, although <laughs> it runs like a sanitizer, <laughs> which is not this, the, the job of it. To identify right. that something is wrong. Or if you got race conditions, you know, and you're getting different values each time, um, it can cause, you, you might, you might find that uh, you have difficulty getting the tools to work on codes that are not in great shape. Uh, some of the strategies are run smaller number of cycles, so you're not hitting some of those errors. Uh, if you uh, run shorter, you may not encounter them. Uh, fix your random number generator so it's not varying. And then look for race conditions. Um, see if you can resolve them. So, this, uh... Uh, something about the, the previous discussion about Cocos. I'm thinking now that uh, if you compile the application and you link with the RockTX library and activate the RockTX, I think maybe it's maybe it can work uh, like yeah directly. Okay, thank you. I will take and, and and check it out later today. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, yeah, it just link with the lib RockTX trace and this yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it should be. Should be at least. 